So I just want to finish welcoming you this morning by quoting my friend Jinder Shah, who says that solving this problem is simply the greatest wealth creation opportunity that will ever present itself to the human race. And that there is just an enormous amount of positive economic <clears throat> and environmental sustainability that is inherent within this entire conversation. So remember the color of green is not only the trees, but it's money. And that we at AREI are not red, we're not blue, but we're green. So we want to bring both sides of the aisle together in this conversation. At any rate, welcome to Aspen and to the second day of the Arde Summit. I look forward to spending the day with you today and also to remind you how excited we are to welcome the former President of the United States tomorrow and those others that will be joining us. Thank you. The great transition is a shift from coal and oil to solar and wind. And most of us know about a little solar energy here and a little wind, a wind farm there, but things are happening very fast now. I think we're going to see about a half century of change compressed into the next decade. And we're going to see a complete restructuring of the world energy economy. A decade from now, the principal sources of energy in the world will be solar and wind, not coal and oil. So it's, it's, it's coming and it's coming very fast. Just to give some glimpses of, of the new energy economy that we can now see at various places in the world. Last year, Denmark got 33% of its electricity from wind. In the month of December, it was 55%. It is the first country to get a major share, the major share of its electricity from wind. But it's not finished. The goal is to take it up to 100%. Portugal, Spain, and Ireland are moving fast, with 22, 18, and 17% of their electricity coming from wind. In Spain, interestingly, Wind has emerged as the principal source um, of electricity in the country, and it has overtaken nuclear. In South Australia, wind farms are replacing coal-fired power plants and doing it very fast. In China, wind-generated electricity has not only overtaken nuclear-generated electricity, but if you look at the curves, the nuclear curve looks like, looks like this. The wind curve looks like this. I mean, it's just a runaway now. So it's, it's exciting to see uh, the other largest economy in the world now moving so, so fast toward wind. There are seven wind mega complexes under construction in China, each of which will have at least 10,000 megawatts of generating capacity. That's 10 nuclear power plants. The largest, which is not surprisingly in Inner Mongolia, a particularly wind-rich area, will, when it's completed, have 38,000 megawatts of generating capacity. 38,000 megawatts is equal to the electricity consumption of Poland. This is not small-time marginal uh, additions to the the world's energy supply. This is big time. We've not seen anything like it. And we've not seen any other energy source, including um, coal and oil and nuclear, scale up to the levels we're seeing with wind, for example, with 10,000 megawatt wind farms and one for 38,000 megawatts. It's a whole new ballgame. In the United States, Iowa and South Dakota are the leaders in wind electric generation, each getting um, about 25% of their electricity from wind. Iowa 
wants to take this to 50% within the next four years. It may become the first U.S. state where wind becomes the primary source of energy. I should say of electricity. How, how has this revolution happened? How has it managed to move so quickly? Incidentally, there was supposed to be a clock here someplace, a timer, and I can't. Where is it? Okay, if you can see it, that's fine. Um, and the, the advances have come from government policies, R&D, subsidies. They've come from environmental groups. The Sierra Club launched in the beginning of 2010 a Beyond Coal campaign in this country. At that time, we had 530 coal-fired power plants. Their goal is to close every one of them. And so far, they've closed 140. So the 530 shot by 140, now down to 390. Their goal is to close every one, not later than 2030. And then we say, well, what about China? Well, China's moving very fast. The coal trust in China, faced with the shrinking use of coal, are on the verge of bankruptcy. There are six provinces in China which have set their own coal reduction goals. They range from the cuts of 5% to 50% between now and 2020. These are individual provinces simply picking it up and saying, basically, coal has to go, and we're going to do our part. Um, there are also a number of cities around the world who are pushing for 100% clean energy, like San Francisco, um, Wellington, New Zealand, just to set a couple. So a number of cities are setting very ambitious goals, goals that are much more ambitious than this, the goals of the states in which they are uh, located. What about India? India is a major source of carbon emissions, heavily reliant on coal or electricity generation, for example. But it's, it's shifting. They have now designed in India solar-driven water pumps that are much cheaper than diesel pumps. Indian farmers currently have 26 million diesel power. Is that 10 minutes? Oh, good. Um, they have 26 million diesel-powered irrigation pumps. And the plan is to replace every one of them with a solar-powered irrigation pump and save a lot of money in the process. The payback time on these solar-driven, solar-powered water pumps is from one to four years, depending on the situation and how, from how far down they're, they're pumping the water. I mentioned earlier the, the scaling up that we're seeing with, with wind farms. We're also seeing the same thing with, with solar cells. Solar cells can scale up and they can scale down. They can scale down to this little strip on my watch that provides the electricity to run it, and they can go all the way up to 100 megawatts, 200 megawatts. There, there, there's really no limit to, uh, to the size. And, and there are close to 100 of these large plants being built now in the southwestern United States. At the end of last year, the world had 139,000 megawatts of solar generating capacity. That's equal to 139 nuclear power plants. But it's growing by an extraordinary rate, uh, between 30 and 70 percent per year. One of the most exciting things happening now is actually an economic development where rooftop solar panels generating electricity are now producing electricity cheap enough to not only compete with but to undercut the local utility. And what happens in this situation is 
as more and more people learned that a rooftop uh, installation of solar panels will provide cheaper electricity than the utility, they begin installing them on their homes. And then for the utility, the market begins to shrink. So they have to raise their prices. And when they raise the prices, even more people put solar collectors on the roof. And it, it's called a, a suicide spiral. But there are many utilities now in this country and, and elsewhere in the world, uh, particularly in Germany, where they've invested uh, very heavily in, in solar cells. The two largest utilities in Germany are really on their knees. Uh, their net market value, the two of them, um, has dropped 56% over the last four years which says something about the market's assessment of utility generated, mostly coal generated um, electricity. So the markets are beginning to pick up these changes. In 2013, 33% of Denmark's electricity came from wind. Um, in Iowa and South Dakota, it was 25%. Texas is pushing hard on wind. Last fall, a block of nine Midwestern states got 20% of their electricity from wind. The state of Oklahoma in October, I, um, Oklahoma in the state of October uh, got 32% of its electricity from wind. I'm, I'm giving these examples and these glimpses just so we can begin to see what's happening. Um, I mentioned China's seven uh, wind complexes. I mean, this is wind generation on a scale we've never seen before. When you talk about 10,000 megawatt plants at a minimum, and and some going up to 38,000 megawatts. There are four states in North Germany that get, get half their electricity from solar cells. And then the exciting thing about having a rooftop um, solar generator is that you can not only run your household, you can also run your car from with solar energy. You're going to need a, a an electric car or a plug-in hybrid, but they're coming. And this also is going to be market-driven. And it's going to move much faster than most people think for the simple reason that the cost of electricity as a fuel is about one-third that of gasoline. And that's going to become clear, I think, to more in the years immediately ahead. We have seen an interest for the several years now in using um, corn for ethanol, um, but I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that's the best use of, of, of land. If you have an acre of land growing corn, you can produce $1,000 worth of ethanol. But if you put a wind farm on that acre of land, it will generate $300,000 of electricity. So we can begin to see where, uh, where the balance of, uh, where the advantage lies as we, as we look ahead. I mentioned Iowa, one sort of wow thing about Iowa, it reflects the extraordinary piece of agricultural real estate we have in the U.S. Midwest. Iowa produces more grain than Canada, and at the same time, more soybeans than China. That's a double wow. But it, I mean, U.S. Midwest is why the U.S. is the, um, is the food superpower in the world. There's no other country close to us in terms of production and, and exports. And, and part of this is the good fortune of having inherited some extraordinarily productive soils. What about nuclear power? I have two minutes to go. What about nuclear power? Nuclear cannot compete economically. The technology's there, we know how to do it, but the costs are just not competitive. Right now, coal and wind are producing electricity at about half the cost of that from nuclear power plants. 
So it's not the technology, it's the economics that has led to the decline in both US nuclear generation and worldwide nuclear generation. Both are on the way down, um, nuclear's on the way out, and I don't see anything uh, reversing that. We've seen a number of things contributing to this transition. One is advancing technologies that have lowered the cost of solar and wind energy. Another is mounting public concern about climate change. This sort of underlies the, the thinking and the, the shaping, shaping of policies in this area. Um, and we've seen some people with, um, with money, a lot of billionaires, really begin to pile money into renewable energy. Warren Buffett, uh, 15 billion a couple of years ago, more recently, another 15 billion going into wind and solar development. Um, Ted Turner, five solar plants in the south now. Um, and, and a wind farm uh, coming in, in Minnesota. Uh, Bill Anschutz, a uh, Denver-based um, guy who made his first billions in, in oil and gas, is building a 3,000 megawatt wind farm in Wyoming, which will, um, and, and a transmission line, so we can ship that uh, Wyoming wind energy to California, basically, in the form of the electricity. Um, so we're beginning to see all sorts of new developments uh, now. Um, I'm down to my uh, final minute. Um, we're seeing some stranded assets along the way of this transition. Coal mines not worth anything anymore. Um, the French firm, Total, the big energy company, um, invested $11 billion in tar sands in Alberta. It just pulled out recently and wrote the whole thing off. Um, oil refineries. Fewer and fewer now. The corner service station, as, as oil use, as gasoline use in the U.S. declines uh, because of more efficient cars and we're driving less. My corner service station just went two weeks ago. It's gone now. And, and this is happening in, in many parts of the world. So service stations, gasoline service stations will be part of the, uh, an important part of the stranded uh, assets. Um, Oil refineries, a lot of them, there's just not enough oil and demand for oil to, uh, to keep them going. So a lot of those are also going to be going. Final point, Chevron, ExxonMobil, and Shell invested $120 billion last year in trying to expand oil production. With that $120 billion investment, they only succeeded in preventing further decline. They were not able to increase it at all. The stock market is, is, not, um, is, is not looking favorably at, at the oil companies. The S&P 500 index went up 40% last year, sorry, over the last three years. Exxon Mobil and Chevron went up 11%. Royal Dutch Shell went down 2%. When I see the oil CEOs now, they don't quite know where to go. It's an entirely new world. Instead of the companies expanding, they're actually shrinking. And this, this is a new experience. But it's an indication of, um, of the kind of thing that we're going to be seeing um, in, the, in the years immediately ahead. And I'm not talking about 20 or 50 years from now, I'm talking about the rest of this year and next year. The, the energy transition, I call it the great transition, because it's going from fossil fuels to solar and wind energy, will be the defining uh, element of our time. This is a historic development. Thank you very much.